Welcome, welcome back to Trail and Alternating Training. My name is Will Franz. I'm a running coach, a strength coach, and the whole goal of this podcast is to help you train a little better so you can perform well out on the trails and have more fun doing this sport that we love to do. If you like this information, I'd really appreciate it if you hit subscribe or leave a rating review or just share it with somebody who you think like might benefit from it and might need to hear it. The more ears or eyes we get on this, the better. And more more people benefit from what I think is some decent information in the space. Anyway, today I want to talk about how to train for an ultra marathon. And right above my head, I probably have, I don't know, 10, 15 books relatively on the topic here. So it's not like there's any, going to be any mind-blowing techniques that you've never heard before. That's kind of the point. There are only two things you really need when training for an ultra marathon. You need to run a lot and you need to recover from that running. Now exactly what that looks like can vary pretty significantly depending on a wide variety of factors, right? You as in your genetics, what you need as in your starting point and your training background, your schedule. Like if it doesn't fit your life, then you're probably not going to do it because for most of us running is Amazing, and it's an important thing in our lives, but we might have kids or families or um, jobs or other things that we, we like and allow us to live the life that we enjoy living and allow us to do this running thing that we enjoy. So running might not be top of the top of the bill for you, right? And then also, what do you enjoy? Like training needs to be at least somewhat enjoyable. Like, I would love if all of it were. Very honestly, there are probably going to be workouts or training or exercises or things that you don't 100%, that you're not like 100% on board with, but you need to do to help get the results and do the fun stuff you really want to do. But for the most part, our training should be enjoyable. Now, because of this wide range of things that can vary from person to person, this is why I'm always a little wary When I hear something like a such and such method or whatever, like um, proprietary techniques to blah, 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 right? Like to me, it sounds like we're trying to cram a human being into a program, to cram a person into a program rather than build a program around a person. So let's look at a few of the factors I mentioned before and see what it might look like or how it might vary your training program. And then we'll also talk about some techniques at the end if you aren't like at all sure what to do. So first, your genetics. Like depending on you and your genes, you will gravitate naturally towards very various different forms of training, right? We'll do a little better if we lean into that rather than completely fight it. Like if we look at me, I'm a fast twitch, like fairly muscular human. And as a result, I respond better to a higher percentage of speed training than what other some, someone else might respond to, right? If I want to run an ultra marathon and run it well, I still need to run a lot. It is not an avoidable thing here. But while I might need to spend the majority of my time running low and slow, I will benefit from a higher percentage of speed training than someone who might just be like a natural slow twitch athlete. My overall mileage might be a little lower week to week than someone who's like really more, let's be honest, built for this sport, right? Now it's possible that you're new enough to athletics that you really have no idea. And if that's the case, then great. But one good sign is what you've been drawn to in the past. Even if you're new to this sport, did you play sports as a kid? Were you more of an explosive athlete who was like better at sprinting sports, things like football or basketball or one of these sports where you're like really moving quickly and then you might have longer breaks? Or were you more of a slow twitch athlete who could run forever? Think like a lot of positions in soccer, cross-country skiing, obviously track. What if you did track? You know these things anyway. And remember, it's a spectrum, right? Like nobody's, well, very few people are like completely slow twitch or completely fast twitch. Actually, nobody is completely one or the other. But nobody's really like fully dominant on one side or the other. There's the ability to adapt. Humans are very adaptable creatures. So remember that we might just kind of be in the middle. I actually do pretty well at both depending on training, but 
at this point, I've trained much more towards fast twitch for a wide variety of reasons. So that is where I live at this point in my life and where I've lived most of my life, because for most of my life, it was very hard to breathe. So the slow twitch stuff was really hard. So if you're just super new to activity in general, then it doesn't really matter. All training is going to help you, right? So like, that's actually really important. If you're currently on the couch and you've been on the couch for a couple of years, just get out and do something while being responsible and avoiding injury. And you should see improvements. And then once you start to become more active and start to train a little more, you will have a better idea of the types of training you're drawn to. And then we can start to make tweaks from there where you might realize like, oh, I really do well on a 60, 70, 80 mile week. Um, it's obviously time consuming, but beyond that, like I recover well, I feel good. Like I could do this many weeks in a row, or you might learn that a 60 mile week is a stretch, but you respond incredibly well to speed training. So we get a lot of secondary benefits from that, right? So kind of learning yourself, your genetics, what you've built up to this point is important. And on that note, what you need right now, right? Like genetics play a huge role, but as I said before, you can train yourself in one direction or another. They've shown that over long periods of time, you can shift muscle fibers to some degree from more fast twitch to slow twitch and vice versa. So no matter what your genetic proclivities may be, um, your training history and the sports you've played through your life and the movement you've done throughout your life can make a significant change, right? And as a result, no matter your starting point, unless you just like won the Olympics or Western States or something, um, you, you can improve, right? You probably haven't hit your life's peak. You probably aren't peaking now. If you are peaking at a certain distance, we can pursue some different distances. There is, there is hope for everyone who wants to like make progress in this sport is I guess what I'm saying. Like all of us can Find a place to improve in running anywhere from these like shorter distances to longer distances. And if that's a thing you want to do, then we can do that. So how do we tell what you might need from a training perspective? We can go to a lab and undergo a lot of expensive testing. That is one option. You run on a treadmill with a mask strapped to your face and a bunch of hoses and get some blood tests and they determine your exact VO2 max in lactate threshold and fat oxidation data. And it's super cool. And when you see the charts for it, you have a really good idea of like what might be wrong, right? You might see this like completely linear straight line. Um, and that means like you just really have no proclivities one way or the other and all training will be good training. You might have this like big sharp curve where there's absolutely like no separation between your lactate and VO2 max. As a result, like we need to raise the ceiling for anything else to work. If you're listening to this and you haven't heard me talk about this stuff before, that's kind of why I'm blowing through it because we're going to get more to that later. But we are looking to see where, like, if you have this testing, it becomes really easy to target training very easily or very simply. Um, unfortunately, it's expensive. It's a pain in the butt. Uh, they, it sucks, like, running with a, like, Bane mask on your face as someone progressively cranks a treadmill and climb up on you is deeply unpleasant. And we can get similar guidance from most, for most people from a few field tests. Unless you just have a bunch of money to burn, or you have really been struggling for a long time to figure out what's going on, and you've tried the field test, and you just can't figure out what your training looks like, and you're really dedicated to moving forward with this, then... I say let's run the field test first and see what happens. So first, um, I'd like to know a couple things if I'm looking at someone for training. A, a pace and or effort that stimulates VO2 max, a pace and or effort that stimulates lactate threshold, um, and a pace that you can carry all day, right? And that would be more like your fat oxidation threshold, your zone 2, whatever you want to call it. As a result, I would also really like to know the difference between those things and your sweat rate, like how much fluid you lose per hour, ideally how much sodium you lose per hour, but that also actually involves like getting in a lab. So let's look at some field tests to figure these things out. One, pace that stimulates VO2 max. 
mile time trial is a really good one for this. When you run a hard mile, VO2 max is arguably the primary limiter other than like maybe leg strength and neuromuscular drive, right? Like your legs are going to get tired from working really hard for very, working very hard for a relatively long period of time for the output. And your VO2 max is going to be, let's call it aggressively stimulated here. We're not going to get super into lactate threshold. Your aerobic conditioning is not going to be the big limiter. Your VO2 max is going to limit you on a mile a lot from a breathing perspective. So if we go do a mile time trial, we will know a pace that pretty solidly um, pushes this VO2 max and or effort, right? Like we have to recognize that if you're doing this on flat ground, as soon as you move to an incline, the pace is going to drop, but we should know what that effort feels like. Now, let's say your mile's like an eight minute mile. Um, it sucks from like minute two. It's just not good. <laughs> it's really not a fun time to go run a minute or a mile time trial, but you can. It sucks from very early on, and then you just hold that unpleasantness, um, increasing unpleasantness, for the rest of the mile. And if we do that, we can figure out kind of a push point or a stimulant for VO2 max. Now, if we do a um, lactate threshold, this would also be another like very hard physiological marker that will give us some really good direction towards training, right? There's two ways to do this. One would be, like, ideally, it's an hour time trial. Like, that's actually what your lactate threshold is. You run, warm up for a little bit, and then run for an hour hard, as fast as you can finish the hour, and then, like, collapse on your knees at the end of it, and then you have hit this, like, lactate space. So... There's also a shorter way to do that because racing and time trials are hard and there's a really long, really difficult effort, especially if you burn out 45 minutes in and don't get great data. It takes up a lot of time. It takes up a, like a day of recovery. It kind of sucks because what we're basically telling you to do for most people who aren't really good runners is like go run a 10K hard, which we would expect like take some recovery time. So instead... We do a 20 minute time trial. You warm up for 10 to 15 minutes and you toss some strides in there and then you run or you like rest for three minutes to let all the energy systems re amalgamate, readapt in your body and calm down. And then you go run a like 20 minute time trial as hard as you can. Again, trying to end pretty toasted with like hands on knees. And that'll give us a good idea. Lactate threshold should be somewhere around like 95% of your pace and like heart rate will be the same during that time trial. All right. And that should give us a good idea of your, your threshold pace and effort. And then your all day pace is pretty easily determinable by the long runs and general heart rate data. Like what can you go run three or four hours for? Right? Like a lot of us have done this in this space. If you don't know, then most people are pretty good. They've shown actually through data that most people are pretty good at estimating this. Like just go tell someone who's run a decent amount. Again, if you're right off the couch, then it doesn't matter. Anything is going to help you. And we're going to ease up slowly enough to where you're going to build a base volume to where you'll be able to know this by the time you're there anyway. But a, um, any seasoned runner is like, nah, I bet I could hold like 11 minute mile for a very long period of time. Um, that's a pretty good guess, very honestly. So we have a good idea. So what do we do with these? Well, first we look for the differences. Um, there should be a gap between these things, like a relatively, whoever for whoever you may be, right? Um, decent gap between these things. If your mile time is a 730 mile, we don't want your like lactate threshold pace to be an eight minute mile. Um, we would like it to be slower than that. Because if it is an eight minute mile, then that means our like effort that we put out to run at VO2 max is basically right up against our effort that we put up to go work at lactate, which means if we don't push our VO2 max up, all the lactate training in the world isn't going to matter too much because the ceiling's too low. We need to raise the, the higher ceiling in order to raise the other stuff below it. So understanding the separation here is really important. So we should see a bit of separation between the, like your mile pace and your lactate pace. We should see a bit of separation between your lactate pace and your like all day pace. 
And if there isn't at all, then again, all training will work. Um, if there's a pretty even split, then all training will work. And if any of them are really close to one another, then we should target the one that's really close. Like if your lactate pace is like a 10 minute mile and your all day pace is an 11 minute mile, but your mile time is a six minute mile, then we should do a lot of lactate threshold work because clearly your body isn't very good at using that as a fuel, right? So this is the kind of thing we can use to direct your training a little more. Now, we'd also do a sweat test, which just again, you um, weigh yourself naked before an hour run. You go out, you run at a like fun, comfortable pace. You weigh yourself naked when you come back. Um, any fluid that you consumed while out on the run, you're going to subtract from that second number and then you're going to subtract that entire number from the number before your run, and then you know how much water you lost. And it'll probably be quite a bit more than you want it to be, because by race day for a 100 miler, we're looking to replace like 90 to 95 percent. Uh, shorter races, you don't have to replace quite as much, because we can end every race a little dehydrated, but dehydration aggregates over time. So the longer the race, the more, the closer we want to be to this replacement value, right? So we can figure that out as well. And then sodium, we can start with a value of like somewhere between 500 and 600 or whatever milligrams per hour, or sorry, per liter, not per hour, per liter of fluid intake and see how that goes. And then we can scale from there. And if you're really struggling, then we can do a bunch of tests. You can like buy a Nix sensor or Gatorade has some of these patches if you have an iPhone, or you can go in and get a like feel an actual test from like precision hydration to see what your fluid and sodium losses are. All right now, do I do these tests with everybody? Definitely the sweat one. Um, the other one, no. I do some of them based on need, but not every one of them with everybody I coach, because. I mean, for one, some people don't sign up with me long enough before their race for it to matter. If you sign up with me for a 100-mile race with three months to train, which is not uncommon, um, one, if you ask me that and you've been doing no training, I'm just going to tell you no because I feel like it's irresponsible. Um, if you come to me and do that with a good amount of training, we'll go, but I don't care what your VO2 max is because we just don't have time to stimulate it regardless, right? Like, that is not going to be the thing that we're going to like spend a month of our three months learning to do that workout, do it well, and do it in a way that's going to stimulate performance. So we might just skip that. And a lot of people like will have recent race data that we can use instead. If you went out for a really hard 10k and your 10k like happened to be about 50 minutes, I know what your lactate threshold pace is. Like that's really nice. Or if someone came to me because they're working on getting out of the injury cycle, we're much more worried about like threading the needle of training to enough to like finish the race and manage an injury and really focus on the strength stuff that's going to create movement changes than I am about, again, like VO2 max, right? Like it's an important metric. It matters from a like overall ceiling perspective, um, the ability to train other stuff, but it's not really relevant on race day. So this is why I'm not great again with the like, whatever methods, because everybody's person is different. And while like mountain goat method sounds really cool um, from a marketing perspective, because it has some alliteration and I just like goats, um, I don't know what it would be other than meet the athlete, see if we get along, determine what they need, see if I can provide them with what they need, and if so, coach them on what they need until they get across the finish line, because that's the whole thing. And that's not really a proprietary method. That's just being a good coach. So this is why I find them odd. Now, um, another thing that I'd mentioned before was make it fit your schedule. And there's a wide variety of things here. I've trained people for ultras on three days of running a week. Um, it was less than ideal. It wasn't great, but that's what their job allowed. And that's what time they had. And they have enough of an endurance background to make it work. Now there were definitely a couple talks of like, uh, you're probably not going to do your best and you sure you want to do this? And they always said yes. And we talked about it before we even started working together. But you have to work with what you have. If you really care about this race and you want to run it, it's important because it's like a social thing that you do every year and whatever. And you only have a couple days a week to train, then you have to work with that or like upend your life. Um, 
the less time you have to train, the less likely you are to run like a great ultra. And now you will have to make some sacrifices, right? Like you're unlikely to run a great ultra and also be able to like be a really good parent and do really well at your job and spend four hours a day staring at social media. So I know which one of those things I would cut. Um, you do you, right? But like, if you sign up for this stuff and you want to do well, you have to do the training. But work schedules and family schedules are what they are. Some of us have less time in the day than others. Anybody who says that isn't, well, functional time in the day than others, like anybody who says it's not true, has never worked 70 hours a week to barely pay rent, right? Like this is hard and it's harder for some. But if that's you, that might not be the best time to train for an ultra. When I was working 70 to 80 hours a week to barely pay rent, uh, that wouldn't have been a great training time. But you have to understand where you are in your life and what time you have and then make the priorities on that. If it's hotter than hell and you can't get a like five hour run without dying of heat stroke, then we can we can figure out a few things. Either we split that thing up, we run at three in the morning, or we don't sign up for races in July when you're going to be have to, having to train through that. Any of those are great options, but let's take all the considerations when we look at time, right? Like you can run big long runs, you can cross train, you can do the stuff on the treadmill, you can do doubles, you can even do triples if you're responsible with recovery. Um, you can do this a million ways. As long as you commit, accept your limitations from a scheduling standpoint, and then put in the work when it really matters, you can do this. Now, if you miss a bunch of runs, like, you have to be honest with yourself about whether, whether this matters, right? Like, I'm not necessarily the person who's going to be a babysitter to anybody. Like, I'm not the hand holdy, now you know you need to run well if you want to perform well on your race type of person. I'm going to be like, hey, you missed a few training sessions this week. What's going on? And it's not meant to be accusatory. It's just like, what's up? And you're either going to say, a lot of stuff happened in my life. Things exploded and I didn't get to it. I'm going to do it next week. And then you'll either do it next week or not. And after three or four weeks, you and I are going to have a talk about like whether it's really smart to run this race or not. Um, or you just had a bad week. We all have them. And then you'll get back to it on less than bad week. Because like, People get fired, other people die, things happen, and you're allowed to have a week that's like really hard, right? So like sometimes things get adjusted. But either is possible, either way I'm here to support whoever it may be, whoever needs it. But you have to be honest with yourself about the time you have and how you choose to use it and if you actually care. And if you do, then I, I will go to the ends of the earth to help you, to like do well. and. I'm a good example of this. Like I regularly skip my own training sessions to help an athlete with the last minute problems. I regularly um, forget to eat because I'm in the middle of coaching, right? This isn't a martyr thing. This is just like, I care about coaching others more than my own athletic pursuits. However, if you really care about your athletic pursuits, like don't be me, um, eat the food and get your training sessions in, which brings me to also four, right? Like this needs to be somewhat enjoyable like and I've said this before and I've said it a lot and I think some people think it's some like woo woo hippie bullshit which it kind of is right like I think to some degree I, I recognize that running should make you happy and that's a real thing and I think we often get caught up in this mindset of like it's hard do the hard work do the difficult thing when in actuality we need to you know just actually enjoy what we're doing, right? Like to some degree, this is a very, um, this is a chosen task. You don't need to train for this, uh, as much as some of us do. It is, it is the thing that we choose to do to have fun. And if we're not having fun, then we should pull back a bit, right? Um, you don't need to run an ultra to be whatever, um, a human being. Like we need to, we need to do a wide variety of things to be a human being and running an ultra is not one of them, right? I think there's a big subset of people who read Goggins' book or Born to Run and like end up searching for this like primal thing about running. And personally, I don't know what that means because like every 
aspect of my life and probably yours would be magic to a hundred people or to people a hundred years ago. Like my bed, magic, my phone, magic, me talking to people through the internet on a video system versus and like just publishing it by myself, magic. And to be clear, like, I'm not sure how I feel about all of that, but that aside, like we're not living some born to run lifestyle out here, no matter how many, how many miles we run or how many steaks we eat or vegetables we avoid eating. So we're doing a challenging activity that hopefully we find fun and provides some sort of meaning to our daily lives, which is super important to be clear. Like I personally think that our side activities are far more interesting than our jobs. I tend to be the like, what do you do on your weekends person far before I ask, like, what do you do for work? Because the former is usually a lot more interesting and indicative of who the person is as a human. So when I say training should be fun, I do mean that. Um, there will be sessions you don't want to do. There will be exercises you don't like, uh, largely because you're going to be bad at them, because the way that you make progress in some ways is to get better at the stuff that you're bad at. But life is short and kind of hard, and a lot of us work like difficult, frustrating jobs. And what we do in our free time should provide us some sort of fun and relief. So if you're dreading running every time you go out and you hate it when you get out there, you should probably find a new hobby or like take a break and come back to it later. Running will still be there. But we should do something that helps you enjoy your Saturdays. And this is one of the things where I talk with people most of the time. Like there's a lot of freedom on long runs from me. Um, if someone really cares about performance and a time goal and et cetera, then it be a little more direction. But a lot of the time it very much is like, hey, you need to go run for four hours. Please go enjoy it because this is like the one reprieve you get from your long job. Go work hard because like you're trying to beat a time, like you're trying to train to beat a time clock. But beyond that, like go enjoy your Saturday. Have fun in the woods for four hours, right? Like there's also an extremely practical side of this because if you have big goals, you will have a lot of work that to do. You will have a lot of work to do. And as I said before, some of it you're not going to want to do. So if we enjoy most of it, you're going to work harder at all of it because it won't constantly feel like a slog because no, it leads to like resentment and burnout and quitting the sport. The constant day in and day in out monotony of bullshit that you don't enjoy doing. So if we're going to thread this needle, then thankfully we have a lot of options. Like I said, in number three, um, but whatever works for you, make the hard week, hard sessions count, do the work, like find some space in the woods, no matter what, it's going to be difficult. Training for the sport is difficult. Doing the sport is difficult. Running really long distances is a, is a difficult thing to do, but it should still be fun. And if this is not your like personal jam of fun, then let's go find another hard thing that you want to do. There's Spartan races, there's mountaineering. Like personally, that's not my hard brand of fun. Uh, getting like climbing Everest sounds like hell to me. It's really cold and my fingers would freeze off. I'm not into it. But like for some people, that's their type of zone two fun and good for good for them. Like everyone should do what their their life calls to them, I guess. So enjoy it. Enjoy your weekends. We just need a little freedom and the ability to enjoy our training. And it will all lead to greater happiness because you're going to put more into it. And I realize a lot of this is vague, but if you expect to get personalized advice from a podcast, then you're not. So five, um, here's where I want to talk about a little bit about like actual training because I've been rambling for almost a half an hour and I haven't said anything about it. And that's because, as, as I said before, there's so many places to do that. Like above me, I'm just looking at like Coop's book and Steve Magnus's book and Chrissy Mel's book and all these things that provide some pretty good advice um, out there. If you want to do the thing, you can download a training for a program from Heather Hart over Relentless Forward Commotion. They tend to be really beginner friendly. They start at a pretty high volume, but beyond that, like not a ton, not a ton of speed work. So like really safe to start to scale into, uh, you can download my program for 50 K a little less volume, more strength training, probably not as beginner friendly. Cause it does like push the speed work pretty hard. You can download a training program from the Roches over at swap. They're also like, they have a wide range of volume per week. 
So my biggest thing there is they tend to be a little on the short side, so make sure that you can can do it going into it. But beyond this, it's just hard. Like the time scale itself can be difficult to provide this advice, right? Like people, a lot of people who are newer to running, like at the idea for an ultra, and then they want to train for it in three months because like running is not quite their thing. Like they love it, but it's not it's not all they want to do. So they don't necessarily want to dedicate their weekends for six months to like training. And the funny thing is like most most newer people probably need six months and most seasoned veterans probably need three. And the people who want the opposite are completely the opposite of what they need, right? So let's talk about some basics to train, uh, basics on training, and then you can like check out a program and see how maybe adapt it to you. So first, like figure out what the race requires of you. If it's hilly, if it's a lot of vert, if it's flat, if it's on road, if it's on trail, if it's rooty, if it's rocky, if it's hot, if it's cold, it has lots of aid stations, very few aid stations, etc. The more, if you're going to get your feet wet, the more information, the better um, for figuring this out, right? Figure out, figure out what you need to do, what the race demands of you, and you'll get there. Then figure out how long you have and plan backwards. You're immediately going to lose like two to three weeks from your taper because of your taper then whatever you have left from now until the start of your taper is what you have to build. Um, if that's six weeks and you're not currently running, uh, you should probably defer that race uh, to next year, if you want me to be super honest, because it's too late for you to do well, and all you're going to try to do is go get hurt or suffer. Like If you can downgrade the mileage like a 12K, great. Uh, otherwise, like just, just defer it and actually train next year like you care about this sport. Um, at least a few months between now and your taper, cool. Like, that's great. Now let's determine what you're really lacking. If you're further out and you're already good at the stuff required um, from the course, then you're sitting pretty. Like, you're if you're close to the race and you're bad at it, the stuff for the course, then not great. And we should we can use some field tests to feel, see what we're really lacking and make the most meaningful progress, right? Like, let's say we have six months. Let's run a VO2 max and lactate test and like see what our curve is and see where we might be lacking. Um, and then we can, like, if VO2 max is fine and lactate threshold is really low, then let's double down on that. If you don't have a lot of time, let's double down on the lactate efforts anyway because, like, you don't have a lot of time. So that's much more race relevant. So let's use that because that's going to apply to your race more. Now, if you want to know what some of these workouts might look like, um, here's two, like five by three minute hills is going to be a hard VO2 max work at like a mile effort, a mile pace, whatever you want to call it. Uh, three by 10 minutes, that's your 10K effort um, with like a two or to five minute rest in between is going to be closer for your lactate stuff. And if you want a deeper dive on this, I think I went into it and episode 141, or it's like three types of workouts to help you run faster, right? Um, check that out. I'm going to put out a guide on this at some point. I'm not going to promise a time when. It may be out by the time you listen to this. So if it is, sweet. If not, uh, it's coming. Now, you also need some deloads in there. Now, if you're doing your own training and you're very in tune with your body, then you can just greatly cut volume when you feel bad. I'm doing that right now. I don't know what's going on. I think I'm a little sick. Um, and I think I hadn't been eating enough and the past few days I've just, I've woken up with my normal amount of sleep and felt really bad. So I'm in a deload right now, which means I'm just cutting volume, keeping a little bit of intensity in there, but we're running like I was running a little over 20 miles a week. And this week I'm probably going to get like eight, like it's a massive cut in volume. Now next week I'll just kind of come back to a build cycle and everything will be fine. Um, and that's, because I've been working out and exercising long enough to know what that feels like. If you don't know that, every three to five weeks is really smart. Um, I usually do three weeks of a build and then a week of recovery for like an online program, especially at a beginner level, because because it's safe is the actual answer. But build slow, do your best to mimic the course as much as you can. If you live in a flat area and are running something mountainous, then you're going to make really good friends with the treadmill or the stair stepper or that really long flight of stairs in your office building. It doesn't matter. Like, don't be afraid of cross training. And if you don't want to do it, then don't sign up for races that don't fit your 
uh, profile near your house. Like, that's totally fine. But if you don't do any cross-training that involves hills and you want to go run the Wasatch 100 and you live in the middle of the flatlands in Kansas, then either cross-train or plan to suffer greatly as soon as you hit the, literally mile one because mile one is an immediate, like, seven-mile climb. So it's it's also a great way. Cross-training is also a great way to like get in volume that almost always requires less impact than running. Like zone two work is really good. You can do a lot of it. You can't do as much running as you can do general aggregate zone two or easy work because the impact is just a lot on your body, right? Now, also do your strength work. Uh, usually one to two times a week, usually not directly after, sorry, not directly before um, a hard effort, right? So do your hard workout, and then either later in the afternoon or the next morning, like do your strength work, right? Like let's separate that. So the strength work, we want the hard running to negatively affect the strength work, not the other way around. The running is still important. The strength is supposed to support the running. So let's go for that. Now we can also do really short, more frequent sessions of like one to two exercises, but whatever is going to fit your schedule. Now, finally, your long runs are there to practice um, race stuff. Like go slower, practice hydration and nutrition, re-up your sweat test every couple months. And if you don't do that, then we might be running on old hydration patterns. If we forget to hydrate, then we're missing one of the biggest benefits of these runs, right? Like running over two hours is not going to create physical pro physical progress, but running for five hours, if you don't know how to do your hydration and nutrition can be super helpful and make sure that you've dialed in that strategy and trained your gut. If you're going out for a five hour effort and not really trying to dial in your hydration and nutrition, you're wasting probably, I would guess at least 50 to 60% of the benefit of that five hour effort. So do the nutrition stuff or suffer at mile 70. Now, the reason that we don't do a like big adjustment on sodium, like you need to, sorry, I misworded that for sodium, make sure that you're like keeping notes, right? Like do 500 milligrams to start, see how it feels, make sure you like run a salt test occasionally, do 750, see how that feels. Always be willing to test and iterate with what you're doing, but make sure you make these adjustments. Now, to see how many carbs you might be taking, we can just do like some math. It's a one gram of carb, sorry, one calorie per kilogram of body weight per kilometer traveled. And, and once we do all that math, and if you want help with this, go to my race day calorie calculator and you can do it for you. But once we do the math to figure out exactly what you need, then we just target that. And for most people, it's going to be somewhere around 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour if we're hitting like a 100 mile pace. If you're going faster, you can push that up. If you're going slower, we can push it down. 60 is pretty good. It's a pretty good target for most people, at least as a starting to see how you do. Now, I've been rambling for far longer than I've done in a while. I really hope it was helpful um, on how to train for an ultra marathon. I realized the first 30 minutes were about all the considerations that nobody else goes into. And then like the next nine were about actual training strategies. And again, that's because they're elsewhere. That's what half of this podcast, at least half of these podcast episodes are, are actual training strategies. If you would like some like personal dialing in time, then about your race, then great, shoot me a message and we will set up a like 20 to 30 minute chat, see if I can help you. If I can, I will. And if you're interested in like talking about coaching, you'll ask me because I'm not in the business of pressuring anybody into anything, partially because I don't like people when people do it to me. And also partially because if like I have to convince you, it's probably not going to be a good fit anyway, because I've just done this long enough. So if you'd like a second set of your eyes, eyes on your training, with no pressure, no questions asked, please reach out and DM me on Instagram or wherever you may happen to find me. Um, and I hope you have a great day and go have some fun on the trails. Thank you again for listening to the Trail and Ultra Running Training Podcast. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Just a reminder, nothing you hear on this podcast is medical advice, and you should always speak with a medical professional before making changes to your training or your nutrition. 
If you enjoyed the podcast or found it helpful, please leave a rating or review. It tells the algorithm robots that people like it, and that means more people will hear it. Or even better, just share it with someone who you think would benefit. If you prefer a video version, head to the Trail and Ultra Running Training Group on Facebook, or check out the Mountain Goat Endurance Coaching YouTube channel. Thank you again, and I hope you have a great next run.